All right, well, welcome to the Kid Lit Distancing Social. I'm Laura Backus, publisher of Children's Book Insider, and we are happy that you're here with us tonight. If you're brand new to us or watching this on replay for the very first time and you want to get on our list so that you'll be notified of socials, our future social guests and other fun stuff we do, go to writeforkids.org forward slash ultimate dash cheat sheet and you'll get on our list and you'll get a free ebook, uh, The Ultimate Children's Running Cheat Sheet, which compiles 30 years worth of beginner tips into one handy dandy resource. And if you are uh, interested in subscribing to Children's Book Insider and have never heard of it, you're in the right place. This is, we starting this month, May of 2021, is the beginning of our 31st year in business with Children's Book Insider. Uh, that's how long we've been publishing. And it is now electronic, fully electronic, about 20 pages a month, appears in your inbox beginning of each month, has uh, marketing info, lots of how-to articles, interviews with authors, illustrators, editors, agents, uh, all kinds of stuff. We have a special above the slush code submission opportunity, above the slush pile submission opportunity every month with either an editor or an agent where they give us an exclusive code that you can use to submit and jump over the slush pile. Plus you have access to our online database of back issues and all our info from 30 years called the CBI Clubhouse. Five bucks a month, writeforkids.org forward slash CBI. Thank you, Mary. She says, congratulations to us. Yes, we're, we're still here <laughs> 31 years later, <laughs> which we're pretty proud of too. So thank you. Okay, now we get to celebrate. Whoa, this is where we celebrate you and your accomplishments. So I have two great celebrates this week. Uh, first of all, Sonia Anderson has two great pieces of news to share. First of all, she writes, I've just signed with an agent, the wonderful Adria Getz of Martin Literary Management, who will represent my Christian picture books. And I also wrote the cover story about the Kingfisher for the spring issue of the kids devotional magazine, Keys for Kids. Yay, so congrats, Sonia, on both of those. Those are two great accomplishments. And Marie Prin's middle grade novel, The Girl from the Attic, which was published by Common Deer Press, was a finalist in SCBWI's Crystal Kite Awards in Canada. Yay, so Marie, congrats on that. And I did go to Common Deer Press and read the synopsis of your novel and it sounds great. Sounds like a great story. So uh, congratulations on having it published and also winning, uh, uh, becoming a finalist in that award. Excellent. So I want to hear your good news. Email me at mail at writeforkids.org and put celebrate in the subject line. And we will feature you on a future Kidlet Distancing Social. And please put celebrate in the subject line. I, I appreciate that you like to write me and chat about all kinds of things, but <laughs> I will misplace your announcement if it doesn't have the word celebrate in the subject line. Just say it. Um, so please do that. And any info you want to send me, if you want to send me a picture of your book cover or the magazine that your piece appeared in or anything like that, I'm happy to run it with your announcement. So I want to hear your good news and no news is too small. Keep that in mind. We celebrate everything. Okay, links of interest. Here's a good link this week. Um, Kindle Vela is something that's been in the news in the industry buzz works right now. Um, and it is a, an Amazon's new app that allows authors to publish their books in a serialized form, meaning like one chapter at a time. Uh, and readers can follow your book so that they get alerted when new chapters are posted. And then they buy tokens from Amazon to, and they pay to unlock your future chapters, and then you get a portion of that money as the author. So it's, it's 
similar to Wattpad in a lot of ways, if any of you have heard of Wattpad. But anyway, this article is really great. What is Kindle Vela and should you join as an author? Posted on the Readsy blog on April 21st. It really breaks this down. It talks about what kind of books work in this format, um, keywords that you want to put in so that people can find your book, um, what kind of rights you're basically allowing Amazon to have by doing this, all sorts of stuff. It's a great resource. So uh, blog.readsy.com forward slash Kindle slash Bella. It's that's as good as the link gets. But if you go to readsy.com, you can also just find and click on the blog and then you can find this article. Very, very informative. And a lot of you it might might be great for your middle grade or young adult uh, books. Most of the readers are going to be teens. This is a big teen scene, uh, these serializations and these these types of uh, apps. So YA, you know, is kind of what you're looking at. Maybe you, new adult, maybe upper middle grade, uh, anything younger than that, probably not. So keep that in mind. Okay, now I get to introduce my amazing guest. Uh, Julie Rowenzock is an author and illustrator, and the artist statement on her website says, I'm a reformed graphic designer, concocting and sculpting story ideas and illustrations every day. Every day is emphasized. We're going to talk about that because I think that's important. Her newest book is I'm a Hair So There, which just came out this past March from Houghton Mifflin Hardcourt. And this is her first foray as both an author and an illustrator. Uh, she's also the illustrator for Lewis by Tom Lichtenheld, which is also from Houghton, which is a, a great book. And she illustrated this lovely board book series for Carla Oceanic uh, for Ballywick Press. Uh, and not last but certainly not least, Julie is the vision behind our Picture Book Summit online writing conference logo and our mascot Dash the Fox. So if you've been to our Picture Book Summit website, you will recognize that. Uh, she works at Old Firehouse Books, which is our local independent bookstore and has learned a lot from that. So I'm going to be talking with her about that as well. So Julie, why don't you come on with me? Welcome to the Kidlet Distancing Social. Oh, Violet says Yay. she loves the fox. <laughs> Yay! Here you are. Um, we're getting like lots of great comments about Dash the Fox in the chat box. So, <laughs> which I still love, you know, I've been looking at that logo for six years now and I do never, I never grow tired of it, which, oh, I, think, nice. which I think is really awesome. Um, says something about a logo there. So, and, and Dash has been all over the world, been photographed all over the world. So he's quite well-traveled. <laughs> Well, thanks for inviting me and happy anniversary. 34 oh. years, I didn't know. <laughs> yes, great. thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, it. I, I feel really old every time I say that. If we've been in business <laughs> for 31 years, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Shouldn't I be retired by now? You know, <laughs> but yes, it's, it's great. We love it. We love it. So, yay. You know, I have had very few author illustrators on the social. So I'm really excited to talk to you about both of those hats that you wear. Uh, so um, first, let's talk about I'm a hair. So there, congratulations on this awesome book. Um, how exciting was that to to get those uh, author copies and see your name in both spots as author and illustrator? You know, well, it's your name's only on there once, but you get two credits, right? right? And I got to decide how it was written. So that was really nice, too. Yes. <laughs> Yes, that's awesome. I actually have it. I have it right here um, in case I need to refer to it during our talk. <laughs> I have it too, just in case you have a Good, question. good. <laughs> and, and actually, this is totally, I hadn't even intended to ask you this question, but as I'm holding it up, I think the trim size is really interesting mm -hmm. for this. It's unusual. What, uh, did you have any input in that as well as the illustrator? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, I had had it a little bit higher and we squashed it down just a little bit more for that more of a stronger landscape feel. So, right. Yeah. Right. That's, it's really cool because it's, it's about the desert. And so you're kind of, you, you kind of get this 
flat, wide expanse, I, you know, feel when you, when you open it up and you, you know, you have the whole landscape there. So uh, it's great. And, you know, you work in a bookstore too. So, so I, you have a, a perspective on trim size as well. When people are self-publishing, their books and they want them to show up in their local bookstore they have to really think about how they're going to stack on the shelves make sure they have a spine that's visible etc and especially if it's like a, a picture book do you have to worry about it being too small that it will kind of get lost on the shelf with all the bigger books not, around not necessarily i think the ones that we have most problem with are the ones that are too high because mm. you can't always squeeze it in between the the shelving and right have, brick wall by the picture books in old firehouse books, the old firehouse brick wall. Yeah. Uh -huh. and they can get scuffed up too if we push in too hard. So you don't want them too wide either. So okay. Yeah. Those are all really good things to keep in mind if you're self-publishing yeah. your book. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get talking about I'm a hair so there. So on the surface, this is, you know, if, if you just read through it really quick and don't really pay too close attention, it's like, well, this is a, a simple concept book um about you know desert animals and sort of pairs of animals that are similar but not the same and often get mixed up um and that's that's a cool idea for for a concept book but actually when you read this carefully it's got a lot of layers to it and which i love i love books that do that that kind of sneak up on you and you go oh i have to read that again because i think i missed something there um so how did you kind of get the idea? How did you work through that, add those layers? What was your process there? Um, it originated with the character. I had developed the character actually for a contest. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my agent really liked the character that I started drawing because I kept drawing him. And then she just said, please uh, write us a story. So um, I pretty much just looked up where I would find jackrabbits. And because of the fact that the Sonoran Desert has, well, two things. One, I've been to the Sonoran Desert multiple times, but also because they have saguaro, uh, saguaro cactuses. So mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to draw saguaro cactuses all over the place. So that's yeah. how I decided to start it. So essentially I just plopped them in the desert and, and went from there. Mm -hmm. um, so it was originally not necessarily thought of as, or put it this way, I didn't think of back matter. I didn't think of adding, uh, I had a few similar, but not the same animals, but not as many as are there are now. That was the suggestion of the editor as well as the back matter. But um, I was really looking just to make a funny book. <laughs> okay, interesting. Yeah. So um, some of those layers, like with the back matter, which gives it, um, more of a stem, you know, you've, that it's got that tie in that for the classroom with the animal pairs and that kind of thing um, kind of came later than after you had sold the book. There were a few already in there. So the story, yes. the manuscript, the text barely changed. That was pretty much the okay. same. So the, mm -hmm. It was more visually that we added more. Right. And so right. this is this is the way the back matter shows up right. where we've got these pairs of animals. And then you want to go back through the the book and find them right. uh, in the illustrations, which is which is fun. I love it when when kids get to do that. And then you have, and I have to ask you about something because so. And then you have this at the at the end where you're saying, can you find these Sonoran Desert creatures? And right. these are all again creatures that appeared in the illustrations, not right. always as part of a pair, right? But just that appeared. And then you have find the dessert hidden in the desert, right? I looked for that. Where <laughs> is this? Okay. <laughs> it's funny because I made it easier. It was harder. Even before. <laughs> right. One more page. There we go. Oh my goodness. It has okay. the same cherry. So that helps a little bit. <laughs> cherry. Yes. I was looking. Okay. You know what? I saw that. But it's black, and I thought, is that maybe um, a bug that I missed, like a spider or something, or some yeah. sort of beetle? Okay, because I did. I looked at that. I was like, that's the right shape, but I was looking for something red. Okay, <laughs> sneaky. That was very sneaky. Well, I don't want things to be too easy for the no, kids. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but so you've got the 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 layer of well. 
the the humor comes from you know the um the ground squirrel keeps calling the hare a rabbit and the hare keeps calling the ground squirrel a chipmunk so you've got this you've got that going back and forth and the story is all about the hare basically saying i am not a rabbit i'm a hare meanwhile you've got a coyote stalking him throughout the book mm-hmm. um and finally you know leaping on him at the end calling him a rabbit which of course made the hare really mad so he <laughs> punched the coyote and got him out of there. <laughs> um, and then and then we've got these hidden creatures in the illustrations. So there's, like I said, there's a lot of really great layers here that uh, I think is so important. I was thinking earlier about how, you know, picture books are shorter text-wise than they were 20, 30, certainly 45 years ago when I was a kid reading them. Um, but I think part of it is because the illustrations do so much more work now than they used to. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there's been this awareness among picture book creators that the kids sitting in your lap is looking at the pictures and they needed more to do. You know, they needed to really be involved in interpreting the story and not just listening to the words. And so I love that, that the illustrations sort of have more uh, carry more of the weight, the story weight, than maybe they did, you know, a couple generations ago. Um, as as a an illustrator who also wrote this book, what was your process? Did you think in illustrations first? Did you kind of, or did you write the text first and then figure out what the illustrations could add? Right. Uh, the story is always more important to me. The text. Mm-hmm. So that I had the character and I was doing some drawings and uh, of the ground squirrel as well, but um, the story has to sit right for me first. It's Mm -hmm. really important. So all of my manuscripts, I've never gone from, uh, I've tried it with my critique group where I've done a bunch of drawings and then tried to add a text and it it doesn't work for me. I need a strong story first, yeah. That's very interesting. Okay. When you were writing, did you consciously leave space for the pictures as illustrators always tell writers to do. <laughs> I probably do because I'm a v- very visual thinker. So even when, if you tell me your phone number, I will see the phone number to remember it. And mm-hmm. so I, so in writing, I'm seeing everything play out like a movie anyway. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. So when you illustrated Lewis uh, by Tom Lichtenheld, um, he wrote it you you got to bring his words to life now he is himself an award-winning author and illustrator so (laughs) how nerve-wracking was that (laughs) very scary (laughs) because i i was afraid people would say well why didn't tom do it you know Mm -hmm. you know it's not as good or it's just the same or yeah right right and what people don't realize is you know first of all he might have been working on another book himself and not had the time um or you know the editor had a different you know they said look we need we need to mix up the illustrations here um we need to, you know this story requires a different style than you have or... Tom told me it's because he just wanted to try it out what it would be like huh well there yeah. you go and how, what did he think did, did you I, ever I think he was pleased <laughs> that's what he told me <laughs> You'll, you'll find out if he ever has another illustrator for any of his Well, he might do that anyway, because it's fun. It's always going to be fun to see how somebody interprets your own It work. is. Yeah. Yes. And I, and I think you did a great job. I love the illustrations on, on that. Um, so what was your, I, I'm curious when you receive someone else's text and you are creating the illustration, sort of what goes through your head? What are the things you look at, look for as an illustrator that writers should know? Um, when for you're... more pictures mm-hmm. coming into my head than the words I'm reading on the page. And okay. I can add more later too, but I want, I can definitely see everything as I'm reading it and see if there's room for me to, to elaborate. Mm-hmm. So, and that for me is the sign that I, that's what I really would like to work on. So. Right. Is the pacing of the text, does it make a difference as far as being able to see the illustrations? If a, if a book is paced well, there are clear page turning moments in the text. Yeah, um, I mean, I've been writing for a while. I've been in a couple of critique groups, so I'm constantly reading other people's manuscripts. And it's when I can't see, when no pictures are coming 
that's mm -hmm. when I know that there's something wrong, but I, I've never really kind of placed that together with pacing. Okay. This be the way somebody's writing something. Mm -hmm. If they're too descriptive, I can't see as much if it's too descriptive because then I see what they've written as opposed right. to what my mind is going to play with. Right. And does that feel like you're being constrained then by their description? The thought of it, yeah. Yeah. yeah it does. Yeah. So there were, for Lewis, um, there were a few um, art notes together with the text when I first read it. But I kind of, I have a really um, pretty good at pushing away things in mm. my mind at, and visually. So um, I just tried to ignore what he had given as notes and mm. go with it first and see what came out first and then maybe look back. But um, I think it was because he got first in that sense, he was able to look at all the illustrations of the drawings as they were coming in and give uh, comments. So mm. there was only one where he wanted to change it up. He wanted to go back to his art note, what he had originally seen, and it did work well. It was, um, it wasn't that I didn't, uh, or that I couldn't do it that way, but I preferred, I had preferred something else at first, but it didn't, in the end, it was fine. Um, the only other, I actually took one of his lines and switched them. So it was same page, same uh, side of the spread. And I just switched it, but I also drew it ahead of time so that I could switch it right back. <laughs> I just thought that the storyline, the way I was seeing it would work better. And that's all. So, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. I've never heard of uh, an illustrator doing that. I know that the illustrators often help determine where the page breaks are going to go, you know, if if the author didn't make clear page breaks. But he, um, he definitely wrote very, it was very, very clear. So the page break was the same. It was just the sequence. Uh, right. visuals. Yeah. Of events. Interesting. And he had no problem with that. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> okay. That's cool. That's yeah. cool. So um, your illustration style for the board books, um, which I love as well, um, uses much more muted palette, softer lines. A lot of board books that I've seen have very bold art and, and bright colors like you use in, in your other art. So what was what was your choice? Why did you make the choice for that different style with the board books? Um, I didn't necessarily make the choice. The uh, publisher and author wanted it um, okay. a little softer. And they had even shown me some other examples of artwork that they liked. They liked my artwork, but they wanted they were showing me the direction that they were thinking. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, I wasn't um, I was using uh, a tablet to draw digitally with, but I was also using traditional methods otherwise. So we stuck with the, the traditional message, um, method, which was pencils, and that is much softer anyway. I mean, mm -hmm. I could have made it bolder, but um, we stayed soft. Right. And I, the designer also added some softness to it as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Do you think it's important for illustrators to have more than one style that they can, they can adjust to different projects like that? No, <laughs> I don't think it's import important. I think it's harder if you have numerous styles to rein them in. Mm. Um, I think that's that could could be a liability. Some people work with it pretty well. Some may not. Um, mm -hmm. For me, it's a matter of just being. Uh, how do you say? Put it this way: I like things that are shiny. So if I, I want to try something new and I get distracted pretty easily, and that's the same thing with illustration. So if I see something I want to try out. I try it out and that's how mine continues to evolve. So it looks like I have a, a pretty big range in, in style, but it's really the same. It's just me trying stuff out. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Now you've been involved with SCBWI for quite a bit. And in fact, the rabbit was a, uh, wasn't it an SCBWI contest that you won? It was uh, one of the pieces in the portfolio when I won the portfolio showcase, showcase that year at the conference. That's right, at yeah. a conference because, and that was a while ago, but yeah, he, he sort of started evolving then and stuck with you. That's great. What do you advise people have in their portfolio? What kinds of work, how much work, that kind of thing? Um, I would say draw what you want to be drawing. So don't be drawing architecture if that's not what you like to draw or cars. Um, it's not bad to show that you can, but don't put it in there if you really hate drawing it. So I don't particularly like drawing horses. Not that I wouldn't, but it's not my favorite thing. So there's no horses in any of my portfolio, different portfolios. Um, 12 to 15 pieces is what people generally say. The only really important piece 
is that you never put in something that is subpar. Okay. Now, subpar doesn't mean that you can't put in sketch, sketchy looking things, mm -hmm. unfinished. That's okay because it shows a certain energy that is malleable. Mm -hmm. But don't put in work that you're really not particularly proud of. That's okay. far more detrimental. That shows that there is there is a lack of consistency. So you right. don't want to show any lack of consistency. And I know of other illustrators who have added their um, sketchbooks either next to or within their portfolios. And the art directors or editors who've seen it have enjoyed their sketchbooks more and have worked with them from that. Yeah. Huh. Do you know the quiet book from Renata Lipska? Oh, well, um, Deborah Underwood wrote it, but Renata um, yes. drew it. And she started out that way, that her um, the editor liked her sketchbook more. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, interesting. OK. And is it important that illustrators these days be proficient with procreate or photoshop and creating on a tablet is that kind of how most art is being done now for books um well, i was given the advice that was i'm trying to think 2013 because i was only working traditionally at that time to go digital because of revision work it is very difficult to make corrections obviously from traditional mm -hmm. um, if you so a lot of people who use traditional will be able to do a little bit of work in Photoshop, but it's very easy for me to completely switch something out uh, yes. digitally. So it just makes me more flexible. But I think you, uh, one should always just go with where you feel most comfortable and what brings you joy and mix it up. Why not? That's, mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to be one or the other. Right. And I think that um, there has there was a time when um, animation or people from animation were coming into picture books pretty heavily. I'm going to say that was about 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that was when digital really took to me, really took off. But there was a lot of it was difficult. The resolution was difficult on the eye. So some parts would be kind of fuzzy and some parts would be really uh, sharp. Mm -hmm. But I think that's changed. I think people have gotten better with that and been right. able to find their own styles within it. So it's just mm -hmm. developing like any other medium it's developing right yeah do you know and you might not know this since you work digitally anyway but if if an illustrator is creating uh in different media on paper <laughs> would they then be required by the publisher to scan that somehow and or, or have it photographed but some people send their original artwork yeah. okay I didn't know if the if the illustrator it's been so long since i've worked in a publishing house i can't even answer this if they are required to send it as a digital form in some way to the publisher not no, necessarily and still okay. send it traditional yeah. yeah okay great yeah back when i was working in a publishing house we didn't have computers you know no no ipads yet no nothing so it was all all old school <laughs> um and then it was just the big question was how big should I make it? You know, we said, well, as big as you want, we can shrink it. Right. Um, well, we have to be equally as, as careful with the resolution too. You don't want to mm -hmm. have made it something too small and then you have to draw it all over again. So, right. Yeah. That is yes, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about old firehouse and your work there. How long have you worked there? I've uh, been there since 2016. So uh, yeah, five years coming up in June. Yeah. And um, I took over for um, another woman who'd run the, as kid specialist who ran the story times. And mm -hmm. um, that's been the best part for me. <laughs> oh, I bet. Story time. Yeah. I bet. That's so yeah. fun. So what have you learned from working in a bookstore that has helped you with your writing and your illustration? Ton. Yeah. Um, because especially when I think any story time, it didn't have to be necessarily in the bookstore will teach you just how kids respond in a group as well as singularly, because sometimes I would only get two or three. Sometimes I'd only get uh, just toddlers. I once had just the baby and the grandparents. So, <laughs> you, you know, you have to adjust to that, but you also have to, you know, which books work better for those different ranges. And if there's a four-year-old in the group, he might get, um, don't let the pigeon drive the bus, but the two-year-olds are, they have no, no clue essentially what I'm asking for them because breaking the fourth wall, they're not quite there yet. Yeah. 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 So where's the four year old's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so you learn a lot about that. You learn um, 
the, what keeps their attention. So if I ever have any trouble and I lose their attention, I reach back because I usually sit right in front of the cubbies where Mo Willems's uh, Elephant and Piggies books are. And I'll grab one out and they, because they are so dramatic, I can always rein them back in. Right. Yeah. Right. Pacing is fantastic in this. Yeah. So that's that's the kind of stuff I was getting at here. So for our for our writers out there, um, I talked earlier about the pacing of the picture book as far as illustrations are concerned, but keeping kids attention, mm -hmm. you know, that pacing is so important. You don't want the story to just the tension to just dissipate, dissipate over several pages. They're not going to sit there politely and wait for it to come back, you know, these right. kids. Um, are there any other things that you've noticed? Are there any books that you can think of that maybe didn't work for a particular reason um, in story yes, time? But I, I wouldn't necessarily mention titles. Uh, no, but I'm just talking about characteristics of oh, that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Where I've, I've, uh, I've learned my lesson not to read a book that I haven't read ahead of time. Okay. That's for sure. <laughs> because I can lose the kids almost on the first page sometimes. Um, yeah, so definitely the opening and, and the attention grabbing, but a lot of it is how you read it as well. Mm -hmm. So somebody can read it pretty monotone, you're going to lose the kids that way too, or to a degree. Right. I think you have better luck when you're not very dramatic if you're just reading with one child or two on your lap. Mm -hmm. uh, but you need a little, you got to put on a little bit of a show. <laughs> Sure. And you got Absolutely. more kids. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Have you noticed any sort of overall, I hate to use the word trends, but, uh, oh, yeah. you know, developments in, in the picture book market? Absolutely. I can mm -hmm. see, I, uh, I know a lot of people talked about the, all the tree books that have been coming out lately. Wow. I could see that coming, but you kind of could see it was going to happen because of the success of an adult book about trees that happened <laughs> maybe two or three years prior. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, I see a trend of a lot of parent grandparent books. I can mm -hmm. definitely say that. Um, it's not strong yet, but I can see it's coming. And the last few years, um, I'm going to say at least two, the last two pretty strongly, and especially we see it now through 2020, but it was already started was the meaningful books. The yes. ones that are there, there are lessons in some of them. They're, um, some of them are just feel good, but they're definitely not meant uh, just to entertain. They're definitely meant to uh, for, for emotion and for, and for a little bit of teaching and tolerance and acceptance and hopefully mm -hmm. empathy and things like that. There's a, right. a lot of those and it's they're still coming. So yes, <laughs> and I personally, I am a big fan of humor books. So I think that's probably why I've noticed it more than maybe somebody else who really enjoys mm -hmm. them. So, I mean, not that I don't enjoy them. <laughs> But I just really love. No, I I totally agree with that. Every time I read um, in Publishers Weekly, you know the reviews of the new books, etc. Kindness, compassion, um, you know uh, those sort of um, books based on emotions, like you said, that and, and what's going on inside of us, meaningful, mm -hmm. very nice books. But but I am seeing a lot of those, and I'm sure that what will happen in the next year or so is. People will say, okay, we've got enough. We need more stories now. We need right. more. Just and we need talk. humor because of all we've been through. I know. The kids yes. have been through so much, they really need to laugh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, do you ever, when you're doing story time, I'm thinking of rhyming books here. Um, yeah. Obviously, they can work if they're done well. Uh, do you, as, as read alouds, do you look at that or is that even a fact? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I also, um, because I, I'll do my story time for about 20, 25 minutes and mm -hmm. I choose three books to focus on. I usually have one or two backups, but the three books I put in an order uh -huh. because of my, the kids I've had are say, one is really generally the youngest. I mean, there's usually babies there, but they may not, may or may not be paying attention. Sometimes the babies are paying better attention than the other toddlers, <laughs> but two to three years old is usually what I have. And um, I choose the book with the most text first, because they're more likely to listen when I first start. And mm -hmm. then it wanes a little bit as I go along. So I choose those with le less text after that, mm -hmm. usually theme them to to be able to ask questions to keep them uh, their attention as well. And uh -huh. then I'll put a craft at the end mm -hmm. that has something to do with the books too, so. Okay, great. Yeah. Now I've noticed a lot of books these days do have back matter in them, picture books, even fiction, or, you know, like your story, it's kind of informationally based fiction. Uh, do, 
Is that something you're, you're, you're noticing too when you're looking at the new books that come into Yeah, nonfiction has definitely been, a, I think there's been a huge wave of, of nonfiction books, which is great. I really, I really love nonfiction. I read much more nonfiction as a reader myself, adult books. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you can do anything with them. And I think that's what we're going to see is because there's so much of it now, like biographies are probably waning a little bit and or at least biographies that are kind of timeline biographies not necessarily slice of life or part right. of a famous person's life that we didn't or never heard of before mm -hmm. um but yeah i think they can be used just as well and especially if there's humor there's a recent one that i absolutely love it's called 13 ways to eat a fly and it's kind of gross and really funny and very informational at all at the same time <laughs> awesome. So, awesome yeah and that's in rhyme as well so oh. See, and that's what I love. The nonfiction is getting so creative and you can be so, you can use all these great fiction writing techniques exactly. in the nonfiction and, and have fun with it, make it funny. Yeah. You know? They have been there, but there just were so few of them that they went on, some of them went unnoticed. Right, yeah. right, yeah. Um, are there any books that people come into the store and say, do you have something on this? And you and you don't and you wish someone would write it <laughs> um i haven't had that experience myself too often because i generally would be up front unfortunately not hanging right. out in the picture book area because that's way in the back of the store um but i actually have asked that at other bookstores i i'll ask the other booksellers um what they've been asked to see the last time unfortunately because it's been so long ago uh, was books about autism that people um were had been asking for Mm -hmm. What I had gotten a lot of was um, books for uh, or that promote a little bit more perseverance and persistence amongst girls, a little bit more um, science oriented, maybe just to, to sh mix it up for sure. Yeah. Right. OK, great, great. Well, let's get to a couple of questions here. Um, Susan, you'll see when you get the replay, all of Julie's books will be on the slide. Uh, there's several there. So, um, so Sapphire says we've been advised to create a dummy book and place the text on the pages to get a feel for the book and make it fit into 32 pages. However, shouldn't this be done together with the illustrator? So text and illustration complement each other. Um, so Sapphire, what you're asking really is two different steps in the process. So first of all, as a, as a writer, we advise writers to create a dummy for their books so they can see how the words flow, make sure and you don't have any turns. of those. And, and excuse me, what did you say? For page turns, this is really and important. Page yeah. Turns. Yeah. And, and to make sure that you have the right amount of text, sometimes you'll have way too much and you can't fit it into those 32 pages. Yeah. And it's really not 32 pages, is it, Julie? You've got no. <laughs> some of them getting in at the end. So how many pages should they eliminate on average from that 32 page uh number oh i go by spreads now so i say in my head i'm thinking between 14 and a half to 16 spreads because each publisher will uh, will have slightly different rules some have the half title page some don't some have the publishing information in the back of the book so it's changed up quite a bit right. And then some um, uh, rather publishers will offer you to do end papers where there's another opportunity to start your story Yes, so that might change. Yeah. So it's uh, interesting to see what happens that might be after you've actually started that you'll be offered the end paper so you can expand upon. So then you can later. expand. And that's okay. something for those of you who who don't know what she's talking about. Um, <laughs> that's kind of a new thing. Um, so these are the end papers are these lovely, you know, and sometimes they're just plain color paper, right. but right. sometimes they're illustrated and some uh, books, some picture books, they're they're actually starting the story visually on the end papers. Right. So you'll see some of the action, and then you have the the title page, and and there'll still be something going on that the characters are doing. Yeah, that's actually the half title. The half title this is and the title page to the title, and then by the time you get to the beginning of the story, right. you that's might have already four. seen some action. Yeah. Yeah, and that's page, page four. four. <laughs> so, so yes, so you're, you're eliminating, you know, at least four pages at the beginning from where you're going to start your text. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind when you're creating that dummy for yourself as, as an author. 
but you're not going to submit that dummy to the publisher. You're just submitting your type to manuscript. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that you shouldn't. You first should talk to your agent about it because mm. they might be if you're going through an agent. But I have a friend who has submitted her stick, not so much stick figures. She gave it a little bit more effort than that, and uh -huh. they asked her to become the illustrator for that book. Right. Oh, so, wow. and she's not an illustrator. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a. You're right. If you have an agent, you can run all this by your agent and get their advice. Yes. Um, that's that's cool that she was able to do that. So anyway, uh, then Sapphire's other question is, uh, shouldn't this be done with the illustrator? So text and illustrate complement each other. So as the illustrator, you create, uh, do you do storyboards or thumbnails or how do you yeah, start, with start with thumbnails? Yeah, I start with thumbnails and I'll move from thumbnails to a bit of a storyboard, which is basically the dummy. So a little mm -hmm. bit larger, say a page uh, for this one. So say it was maybe only about this big, the, yeah. the, the dummy part of it. Um, and then after you've talked back and forth, back and forth with the editor and uh, art director, sometimes they're the same person. Mm -hmm. uh, but after you've talked to them, you come to the conclusion of, because I've always put my own handwriting in just to, so I could see it, would this be where I put it? And we changed a lot for Armour Hair. So there, because of it, the fact that it's mostly in dialogue. Mm -hmm. So we had to have them uh, have the text exactly so that you could know who was speaking. We right. did use an extra device of color. So you'll see that uh, chippies are slightly golden and jackrabbits mm -hmm. are white. And then in the end, oops, sorry, taking this off. Oops, back one. His are in black. Yeah, totally. <laughs> the <Yep>. predator. <laughs> so. That's great, yeah. Um, and then, so this is something else people might not understand so that's a process if you were if you were the illustrator so like for lewis where where tom wrote it but you you, you created then the thumbnails and the storyboard i assume did he see it at that point and yeah, i'm he sure he did but i wouldn't have been privy to any of that that was okay. just between him and the editor okay. the editor thank goodness always gave me um at least the assurance and the feeling that I, if I was really adamant about something that I wanted to keep, even though uh, they may have thought something else, that if it was really important to me, she wanted to know. So it was very inclusive experience, the whole thing. Yeah. Great. Now he got to see it at that stage, but as a first time author, it's most likely you won't, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> it's only because of his reputation. And he's also an illustrator, so he could actually give appropriate feedback. <laughs> yes, absolutely, because he's also a designer. He was he came from mm -hmm. advertising. So okay. he says a lot about composition and design. Yes. yes. So his input is is important. Whereas as a first time author, if you have no illustration experience yourself, you probably won't be asked to weigh in on the storyboards because they really want the illustrator to lend their expertise. But the art director will be part of that discussion. Yes. yes. As well and, as the, um, on Lewis, because I had handwritten in all of the text, mm -hmm. she then asked, because they liked it that a lot, but they didn't think it was as legible. So she created a font out of my own handwriting. I had to redraw each letter so that the heights were always the same. And she gave me the old fashioned paper that they have in a grade school. Yes. <laughs> she didn't send me the paper, but it was all digital, but it looked exactly the same. And I had, so I could keep all the letters the same X height. Yeah. Wow. And then she's so cool. out of it. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's really great. I love that. I love that. Okay. Um, Liz is asking, this is getting back to your storytelling experience here. What do you notice that kids find especially funny in books? Are there certain kinds of things that the picture book audience particularly likes? You know, I'm not really sure. I don't, I've never really thought about uh, the kids angle as far as what they find funny while I'm writing. It has to be funny to me first. Mm -hmm. I consider myself a bit of a kid anyway, very childlike. I laugh at sounds and things like that. Oh, I'll laugh all by myself in the kitchen. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> um, so I think that helps just being, just connecting to that child inside of yourself. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think you can write uh, funny to, to someone else because humor is so 
you know, everybody's got their own taste. Yes. Uh, how many times have you watched a movie where you're laughing hysterically, but your partner isn't? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you have to please yourself first. And right. I think then your agent, your editor, your critique partners, they help you find what's right. funny. But right. I, I can't say that I've ever, I mean, yes, of course, uh, silly jokes, fart jokes, things like that. Um, but you never know what they're going to find funny. Yeah. I think, um, and, and, you know, also the picture book crowd is pretty broad. It could be as young as two and go up to like eight. And the, the sense of humor is very different Absolutely. with a six-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, so you have to have an idea kind of of that slice of that audience that you're going for, who's, who's kind of your target reader. And I think getting more toward the kindergarten age and, and older, you can do wordplay, you can do a word that has two meanings, you know, and, and there's confusion over which meaning it is. Kids will start to understand that that's funny, right. but a three-year-old won't get that at all, you know. Yeah, so you but, do have to be careful that when you're, you're not just writing to please yourself. It exactly. has to be a, a yourself that is very young. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then I think it, this is just my personal observation with humor in picture books. Uh, anything with it's got to have a visual component because it's being illustrated, obviously. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think in your book, a lot of that visual humor was this hair being so sure of himself and he's being stalked by the coyote and the the reader knows they're like, oh, oh this this coyote's getting closer and closer and the hare is just like bragging that he's a hare and he's awesome and not paying attention to what's going on around him. So um well this know. is also one element where yes definitely the the humor is there because there's something that the kids can find out. But this is something that's really, really important. I don't care if a book is funny or meaningful is that you leave room for the reader. Yes. We, we talk about leaving room for the illustrator but you wanna leave room for the reader as well because it's you're not just the two of you writing and making a story exactly. for everybody exactly. else. Yeah. And that's what's, yes, that's what the best picture books do. And it's often in the illustrations they do that where right. there's this subplot and the kids are seeing it and they get to be smarter than the character right. on the page. They have more information. Yeah. And so, and that's, that gets them really involved in the story. And the end papers and half title, title page, they can, in, you, you can use that to invite. Mm -hmm. So it also depends on the reader. Cause I've seen a lot of um, librarians reading uh, say Lewis online. And a lot of times they'll flip right to the first page. They won't even look at the first, uh, the end papers or the to half title title. And it's kind of disappointing for me because that's part of the surprise in there. Um, for Lewis, he comes in a box, right? Yes. So if you skip that page, even though it's on the front, we know he's in a box, but it's kind of unopened yet. It's a little bit of a yeah tension. Uh, so uh -huh. then it just it makes it automatic. But if you leave that out, I think you're missing something. So I do too. Yeah. I do too. <laughs> That's another, yeah, that's definitely true, is that that's part of the humor that you can really invite the kids in on themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Great. Um, so Sheila asks, um, are you finding an overabundance, well, we kind of touched on this a little bit, of books where emotions and meaning are layered in on a more serious note? Yeah. Uh, does it reflect these times and parents' anxieties? Uh, and Sheila also says she loves how light your books are with oh. serious <laughs> snuck in, but the overall tone is very light. I, I do too. Yeah, definitely. I definitely see that the, 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 all these meaningful books are definitely more for the parents. Not yes. that the kids don't enjoy them. Mm -hmm. I think they'll enjoy them just as much. But overall, um, I think parents are, uh, we're kind of catering a little bit to the parents in that way. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's interesting. I'll yeah. see how that plays another, out. Just to add it, because I don't want to forget it. One thing about working in the bookstore that I've learned because of your of selling the books and what people bring up to the front counter is almost, or at least 50% of them are classics. Mm. So we are essentially competing against dead people all the time. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> right? We, yeah. we have to remember that. So people come in thinking they may know what they want or, or not sure yet. And they're not going to take the time to look through all of the picture books to find what they want. They will almost always go for something that they know. Yes. Which is unfortunate. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I try to keep all the new books face out 
and not necessarily the classics. They'll find them, they'll ask me. So I try to keep it uh, to new people and mm -hmm. new authors, new illustrators. I think I think that's so true. And I think a lot of it is just, they don't want, like you said, they don't want to take the time to sit there and read through 15 different picture books, new ones, and to see what's out there. And it's a yeah. risk, right? Because they don't know if the kid's going to enjoy it. So if it's something that they can trust, they'll, they'll more likely yeah. tend to go with that. And with picture books, especially, I think we have such clear childhood memories of our own books that were read to us. Absolutely. And there's an emotional attachment there, too. And we Absolutely. want to duplicate that experience mm -hmm. um, with our kids. Yeah, I had to learn very early on my son, who is an artist. Um, when I was pregnant with him, I was collecting all these picture books that I loved. I couldn't wait to share them with him. I learned very on that he, early on his taste in art was completely different than mine. Wow. And I had to pick books with art that he liked that attracted his sensibility. And then he would be into reading them over and over and over. Well, okay. I have to have another discussion with you about that project. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah. But if if he, you know, and and he liked very bold, geometric, colorful, you know, art. It was interesting. It was very eye opening for me. And 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 I actually discovered a lot of new illustrators that way because I was looking at the art through his eyes and finding the books that he That liked. is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, in fact, I want him to come in and talk to you. He's still in Fort Collins. So oh, great. you should have a you should have a talk about this. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, V. Johnson asks, when you're self publishing, should you have a half title page and title page, copyright, dedication, interior page, start your spread on, eight, on page four and five? So, yes, if you're self publishing, should you have all the same components as this book in the front matter? Um, and I think uh in most cases you should i don't do you have a, an, any opinions on that julie only, only look to the books that you enjoy yourself that you find appealing uh, uh, uh aesthetically and mm -hmm. then go with that right if you feel comfortable with it if you're not yeah. sure about it go with something that you already enjoy sure but it's always good to model after you know like like julie said a book that you like and there is certain information you're going to want to make sure you have on the copyright page um and obviously the cover you want to make sure you have the the barcode and the isbn number and all that stuff um which all books on self-publishing will tell you about um but i've seen books where they put you know the dedication at the end or acknowledgments page and you know it just kind of each story is a little bit different in right. that respect yeah uh uh oh V. Johnson also asked, should all picture books be eight and a half by eight and a half? No, this is, um, what are the exact? Seven words? by 10, actually. Seven by 10. So yeah, we talked about this a little at the beginning, kind of the shapes. And I think the the trim size uh, fitting the topic and the tone of the book mm -hmm. is really important. Right. Um, which is and also how you like to hold it because i had uh talked to my ch that's a good thing to do too talk to your local children's librarian so i i've known two of mine very very well unfortunately they're both retired now it's covid so i don't get to know the other ones as well yes um, but we talked about the fact that i like hold, the way i hold it when i'm doing story time made a big impression on me so that's why i chose the square format so i could have a fairly nice la landscape but that it wasn't too high so that I could read it really well. Oh, See how right here? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, everybody's got their own preference about how they hold the book. The only other thing that I learned, or a very important thing that I learned from my librarian was don't scan your book when you're reading to a group of kids. So if you're holding it up in front of the kids, keep it where you've got it. The kids will move their seat to be able to see better. Don't scan because it's too much. The little guys can't see right page if you do that. Right, right. Oh, keep it still and let the kids move around. Okay, good yeah. tip. <laughs> <laughs> Librarians. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, Glynis asks, how long do you pick away at an idea before you realize that it's not going to work? <laughs> Oh, uh, sometimes I'll pick a little too long, um, but I put them in the drawer and then I'll pick it. I'll pick it back up again later and see if I still like it or not. If I still like it, I'm still going to work on it. Sure. Yeah. 
And sometimes you just need that space from it for a while mm -hmm. to get a, another perspective on it. So in other words, don't throw anything away. Right. <laughs> and you might like a bit and use it someplace else later. So yeah, yeah exactly, away. exactly. Um, in your dummy to submit, uh, this is for author illustrators. Uh, when you're submitting a dummy to uh, editors or agents, uh, how precise do you have to be about the page turns? Are editors forgiving? So that's yeah, that's important. <laughs> that's probably that's more important than how good your drawing is in the dummy. I think because that they're gonna they're gonna think you're gonna take your time with the drawing, but if you don't understand the pacing and the page turns. Right then there's uh, two, there's a big lesson. <laughs> so work on the page turns even more so than, than uh, how some people draw very tightly because they like to draw very tightly. So I prefer loose, but then I've already noticed that even my agent can't see what I'm doing if I do too loose. So I have to be careful about that. I have to draw enough that people feel comfortable, but I like to leave a little bit of space so that if I change my mind later, I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, and Robin just asked, what does a page turn mean? So again, for people who are really new at this, um, let's talk a little bit about what we're talking about the page turns in, in, the, in the dummy, the, those moments in the text where you're gonna turn the page and it's going to do something with the pacing of the story. There's, there's like a little anticipation and then you turn the page to see what happens next, or there's some sort of question and you're gonna, get an answer or, you know, the, the, uh, the character is trying to solve their problem and then you turn the page to see whether they succeeded. Um, are there any other tips for, for page turns that you think about when you're creating your dummies? No, I, for me, at least I, I try to leave it up to my intuition, but mm -hmm. it has to be checked later. I, I, but I first go by intuition, but I have, uh, I don't want to say I've studied more than anybody else. That's for sure not the truth. But I read a lot of picture books. If you can mm -hmm. see my uh, end table over there is loaded with books. And I almost always have about 50 books out from the library at any given time. I live pretty close to the library. So I go there two or three times a week. Plus I'm at the, at the bookstore. So I read the brand new books that are coming out or the advanced reader copies. Um, but I... There was a time when I first started out that I was reading about 100 books a week. They only take a few minutes to read, so it's not an undoable ta task. Plus, after a while, you start to know when something's not working for you. Yeah. And I have no qualms about tossing a book aside if I can tell it's not working for me in the first page or two pages. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> and what I used to like to do is put them in different piles because I judge by the cover just like anybody else. So I put it in a pile saying, this is definitely going to be good. And this one's like, eh, this could be good. And then this one's like, eh, it's probably not going to be the best of the bunch today. And I love that I surprised myself, that I've totally fooled myself. And they could be completely different at the end, the uh, piles, how I would put yeah, them together. So yeah. Yeah. it's a good way to teach yourself. It is. Uh, obviously, reading anyway is a good way to teach yourself. But ask yourself more questions why you're reading them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And when we're talking about the page turns here, if there's a book you particularly love, really study what happened right before the page turn that made you want to turn the page? And what were you feeling? What were you anticipating? And did that page turn deliver? Or did it surprise you? Surprise is good, you know, but disappointment, not so much. Right. <laughs> so those are the questions. And, and then you will build those moments into your text. And then when you create a dummy for your book and lay the text out on the pages, you'll see if those page turns actually work for you. What, what also can help, but I think it would depend, depend on how you feel about it. But I used to, if I liked a book like that, I found that the pacing was really good, I would write them out. Exactly. And I've actually saved, I don't know how many manuscripts that way, just yeah. so that if I want to go back and see where did they turn that page again, I have it right there if I didn't happen to purchase the book. But right. it really helps you know, just because it becomes part of you a little bit kinetic in, in that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, that's a great tip. That's a great tip. Um, have you read your own books for story time? And if so, I how haven't had a chance because they both came out during COVID. <laughs> oh, I have read to classes on World Read Aloud Day, for example, but I haven't had a chance to read in person story time. And that's why I've been a little bit, uh, I've held back from doing virtual story times because it, there's a huge 
chemistry that happens when you're reading in front of somebody with somebody and mm -hmm. I, I kind of don't want to ruin it so I can't wait till we can read story oh, time. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah I bet that'll be great that'll be so fun um I'm just scanning through the last couple questions here we're getting up to the top of the hour um Ashley asks who are some of your favorite artists Oh gosh, I have so many. I think I admire people more in that sense that do stuff that I know I can't do or don't have the patience to do. So somebody like Barbara McClintock, who is so uh, accomplished. I mean, just absolutely gorgeous artwork, who I still think deserves a Caldecott. <laughs> I'm waiting for it to happen. Yes. Um, oh, but there's so many. So Isabel um, uh, Alemania, I think is her last name. Alem I can't remember, uh, from Canada. Uh, there are quite a few French ones, um, S Swedish ones. I used to live in Europe, so I'm more uh, I'm quite still quite familiar with a lot of the artwork there, and mm -hmm. just followed ever since. Oh, especially out of Portugal, there's quite a few great ones out of Portugal. Uh, Marisol from South America. Um, uh, Katja Shen is one of my real big favorites right now. I mm -hmm. absolutely love Turtle Town. If anybody wants to look for it. Um, Chris Houghton because of his use of color. So it's just, I think it's for people doing things that I don't or do or haven't thought of. Those all become my favorites. So yeah. Well, and on your blog, you highlight a new picture book every Friday and talk about what you like about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a great place to go see Julie's take on on books. Yeah, I also and have a little uh, link on in the menu that says illustrators I like, but link like mm -hmm. so there are a few quite a few in there that i do really admire yeah great great well julie thank you this has been awesome and very informative and i'm so glad we had you on and i'm so excited for your success with these two books out during the pandemic brightened your pandemic a bit i'm sure yep <laughs> <laughs> well new work always keeps you good going too so i'm really yes. happy to be working on something new right now yeah great great yeah. Well, Look forward to hearing about that when it comes out. So, well, thank you so much. And thank you all for being here with us tonight. And we will see you next week. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.